Assalamu alaikum. Mr. Moderator, our distinguished guests, brothers and sisters, our friends and, and our enemies. طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين I see some people have already joined this live alhamdulillah uh, brother Nathan wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Ahmed Rasuli how are you man wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I hope everybody is doing well I hope everybody is uh, excited about this time together with our dear Sheikh may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless Sheikh Abdullah Hakim quick welcome to this live on your I mean you're the host and the guest mashallah how are you doing today Sheikh Yes, alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to everybody uh, who's out there. I'm doing fine. Alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you. So, Sheikh, uh, today we actually wanted to talk about um, this new documentary that uh, we've been working on, you and I. Uh, so it's, it is a um, it's a full-length documentary, but it is uh, we, try, we decided to break it up, I guess, into uh, three different parts. And we've been releasing. We released the first part and we released the second part. For those of you who haven't seen it, uh, go ahead and uh, watch it, uh, inshallah, when this life uh, is done. It is something that's going to uh, open up your eyes. It is a, uh, uh, a documentary that is uh, written, in a sense, really by Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick and uh, produced and directed by myself. And in it, the real black eye. Sheikh Abdullah, uh, go ahead and tell us about this documentary. What, are you, what, are, what were your thoughts when were you making it? Yes, basically, you know, the whole concept of a documentary uh, is, is, is to bring, you know, reality to people, bring something which is living, um, and especially that is relevant to, to the circumstances that they're in. Mm -hmm. and so, um, within the last six months, of course, the whole world has changed with the pandemic, with the economic recession, with the open rise of racism. Um, I have never seen in my life so many people questioning um, the media, questioning their roots, questioning history, questioning just about everything. Mm -hmm. Only the younger generation. No. So um, I felt that really it's time uh, for me as one of the elders, you can you can say, um, who's you know passing you know through life and um, has experienced a lot of things. Because to a certain extent, uh, life is like a cycle. There are cycles no. that society goes through. No. And so th th this is really why I wanted to express it because, you know, um, I lived, I, you know, grew up in the 60s. And mm -hmm. this was a revolution. This was the black awareness. This was a major uh, revolution uh, that happened in the United States and around the world. And then there was a suppression. And now we're back again. So like mm -hmm. we're going back on the circle. No. And so, you know, it, it's history or it is really experience. So so it's yeah. really to 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 give some experiences, you know, some information in a way that could be easily uh, accessible to people, uh, especially the younger generation. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, and it certainly is, a, a, you know, timely, as you actually mentioned itself. But a little bit even more than that, Sheikh, um, because we're talking about these issues that are uh, being discussed in the outer community, but at the same time is actually also being discussed within uh, our Muslim community, right? Like we're, we're talking uh, about um, the, I guess, really historical events that even Muslims are in need for it. I, I, want, I want you to talk to me a little bit about how you're seeing the community, I guess, um, <laughs> reacting to this, or why did you decide to, to talk to people from, from, from a Muslim lens? Yeah. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me uh, to be in a leadership position in one of the big masjids uh, here, you know, in Canada. After I had, I had gone to Arabia, uh, I was in Jamaica and the West Indies for a number of years. Um, and then I came back to Canada uh, and I became the imam in the Jami Mosque. And mm -hmm. there we had a thousand people from all different nationalities. It was probably the largest masjid in Canada. This is around 1985. Mm hmm. Okay, and so um, I, I, I threw myself into the community and I threw myself into the cultures and people accepted me because I was not an Arab. I was not Pakistani. I was not Turkish. Um, I was not even, a, you know, a mainstream African. Uh, I was something sort of flexible and malleable, you know, that, that you know, you, yeah. you sort of have to bring you a sort of a fresh Islamic perspective. Yeah. And so I innocently did this and went into the societies. And realized a lot about Muslims that 
Many Muslims came to this part of the world escaping poverty, escaping violence, and they looked uh, at Canada and America as sort of like a paradise on earth. You know, it was like a Shangri-La. It was a place where there was peace, especially in Canada, yeah. where all your dreams could be fulfilled. And I, I realized that, you know, while I was helping them to fulfill their dreams, I was living a nightmare. And that is because being an African-American with Caribbean roots and even having a little First Nation roots, um, I understood the, the trauma and disaster of our existence. And, and that trauma and, and, and disaster, which has been going on for over 500 years, is reaching a climax point. And our community, to a certain extent, wanting to live that dream of mm -hmm. escaping violence, escaping you know, their reality into this false construct, um, needed to be uh, awakened at this point. Because where the danger was is that you had black uh, youth, uh, Afro-Americans, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Canadians, you know, who had been in the struggle from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and recognized that revolution is supposed to be a full way of life. A revolution is a change. And so we recognize that just using political slogans uh, or just saying, black, you know, uh, I'm black and I'm proud, black lives matter, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's not enough. It is, it is important. It's necessary to understand your identity, but it's not sufficient. So we recognize that there's something else. And that's where, because Islam then gave us a worldview. It connected us to our original roots in Africa. Mm -hmm. It also connected us to the rest of the world through the lens of the Muslim world. And that was a beautiful thing. But the real black eye, and, and this, is what, this is what the discussion is, is that, you know, we got a black eye from the society, right? We're wounded people coming into the masjid. And when we came into the masjid as Africans and Canadians and even African people from the continent to a certain extent, no. we, we experienced a type of prejudice which bordered on racism in some cases. Now, you, you're running from white supremacy. You're running from violence and racism. And you come into a masjid and then somebody starts staring at you, looking down on you, prejudging you, and in some cases, using racist comments. And yeah. that is in the house of Allah. So mm -hmm. that, that's the essence of the real black eye, right? Yeah. This is the unique phenomenon. And I felt that, you know, since I've, I've lived in the Muslim world, I traveled to 63 countries, you know, visiting Muslims. I lived in Mecca and Medina, you know, for a number of years, you know, and grew up in this part of the world. I, you know, I, I was uniquely fitted to sort of bring it out to people. Somebody's got to bring this thing out to our society. Yeah. And, and, and wake us up. Because I still believe that Islam uh, and Muslims have the solution. But Islam is a way of life. But Muslims are supposed to be the practitioners of the way of life. Nam. But if Muslims Nam. get caught up in white supremacy, which, which creates not only a superiority complex in the white people, but an inferiority complex in the people of color, right? If we get caught up in that, then we won't even be able to give over the beautiful message of Islam to wounded people who are coming into our masjids and Islamic centers. No, no. Zakallah khair, Sheikh Bala bless you, inshallah. I just do want to go ahead through uh, some of these comments uh, that are being sent to us here. Uh, so... Fayazuddin, so salam alaikum, man. How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Um, I, uh, Brother Nasser, salam alaikum again, Sister Sakina. Um, Brother Asad. And I also, oh, even uh, Sheikh Mustafa Khattab is on here as well, mashallah, watching us. If uh, all of you guys, inshallah, if you're watching this uh, live and you want to ask the Sheikh quest a question, go ahead and um, post a question, inshallah. What we'll do is we'll go ahead and get an answer uh, to you from the Sheikh Bidnillahi Ta'ala. Uh, we do have close to uh, about 50 viewers so far on all of our, our channels here. So this is an important thing. Um, all right, Sheikh, let's talk now a little bit more about, uh, so I mean, it's really just that to add to what you were speaking about, because one of the first lines or one of the, the, the I think this is something that we discussed as well, even in the editing, if you remember this or not, when we were editing the, um, the, the, the movie, which is the line when you said, 
I am an African American. And it seemed to me like when you were saying this, um, it came across as if like you are trying to really uh, uh, cement in, in, in the brains of people uh, uh, an idea of like, like, listen to me, I've gone through the experiences. It's not like, it's not like, you know, they always say like seeing is not like hearing or hearing is not like seeing. And, and both of those are not the same as, as experiencing at all, right? Okay. So when they say, yeah, and, and that to me, that line right there was, even though um, I know there was discussion of removing that line or not, but I really wanted to keep it. And I think you had the same kind of, um, I guess, idea about it. I want to talk about, uh, the difference of speaking out of experience versus, uh, I guess, really speaking out of knowledge. Because a lot of times we have a lot of imams who say, you know, racism is uh, not a Muslim thing. And, and, and they might say it over and over and over and over. But it's not, it doesn't come across the same way as when um, someone like you says it. Yeah, that's right. You know, and um, it, it was really important for me to say that not really for the Afro-Americans or, or the Caribbean people, because they would listen to me and look at me and know. Because no. among us, Afro-American or black, we use the term black. Um, it can be light skin, it can be dark skin. You know, it is, you know, the people who are descendants of the enslaved people from Africa who suffered during the slavery period. But for our community, we tend to look at a person and then judge them based upon our own standards. Mm. So when I was living in Saudi Arabia in Medina, um, the people thought I was a Moroccan, uh, or they thought I was Egyptian. Yes. So that happens a lot. So Sheikh, that happened to us in our. Uh, if you remember, this happened to us in our trip uh, to Morocco as well. When uh, the, the 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 guy on the boat just wouldn't let you in as an American. Right. Because you know this is this is how because they tend to look at you if the, and 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 because I am mixed in a sense, you know they you know, it, it appears though you know I'm, I'm something else. Yeah. So, you know it, it was important. You know, and e even when I was the imam in the Jami Mosque, and, you know, I'm speaking Arabic, I'm, I'm, I'm clearly reading the Arabic, but mm -hmm. then when I speak English, it's, it's obviously, you know, first language, clear English. Yeah. Um, but the people, many of the people could not believe that there's actually an Afro-American who's the imam of a thousand people that includes Arabs, Pakistani, Turkish, Swahili, how can this be possible? They, they'd never seen anything like that. And even what, like, what, do they, what do they think, Sheikh? What do they think? You know, there was a group, you know, amongst the Arabs, there was a group of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. They thought I was a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's actually a, a tribe in Palestine called Quick. Mm -hmm. Oh, Allah Akbar. Yeah, Kaf, Wow, Ya, Kaf. Uh, I think it's a Turkish or a Kurdish name. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't believe I was an Afro-American, although I spell Quick. Q U I C K. Mm -hmm. so yeah, maybe he's a, you know, Palestinian or part Palestinian. Maybe he's one of our quicks. Yeah. Because really, for, for most people, if you are a, a, a black person, an African, especially an Afro American, when you come in the mosque, they will say, "Mashallah, brother, uh, can you call the Adhan? Can you be our Bilal? Or, mm. can you, or or can you do security? So these are the two positions: call the Adhan or do security." Because Afro Americans are strong and tough, and they have nice voices as well. And if mm -hmm. it's a sister, they would want the sister to, you know, cook some food, you know, take care of the kids. Mm -hmm. They couldn't visualize that in, in you know that type of person in a leadership position, and so therefore, um, uh, I didn't come to the mimbar to push my nationality or to push any nationality. So one of the things that you'd see if you go back over my khutbas is that I, I'm trying to come from an Islamic perspective. So in other words, it's not Afrocentric. It's not Indocentric. It's Mecca-centric. Yes. Right? And, and no. so, you know, I, I did not push my nationality. What's happening now is that it's coming to the surface that people of African descent are, are suffering in the mosque. Now, this goes even beyond just Afro-Americans. Because the same phenomena is hitting people of, from East Africa, from West Africa, African people from the continent, Muslims who are coming to America, they're suffering. When they mm -hmm. come to Masjid, sometimes they're also suffering a type of prejudice or discrimination which borders on racism. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very serious situation. And, and, and that's the reason why 
you know, we took the time to put this documentary out. We are, we're planning to have a series of courses, you know, for people of, of interactions, for people to try to really come to grips with this phenomenon. Now, I believe that if, if Muslims understand what racism is about in the 20th century, and if we, we come to grips with our own bias, our own prejudice, then I believe we have the solution. We have the solution. But if we don't come to grips with it, then we'll be part of the problem. Well, yeah, no. One of the things you've mentioned as well is that you said is, uh, which is, I guess, really important when you're saying I'm not here on the member to push nationalism. I'm not here on the member to speak about your background and so on. I, I find it really problematic. Is, is there a problem, uh, I guess, with uh, someone being proud of their background? Is there an actual real issue? Uh, is, is there a problem in Islam and itself with someone being proud of being black, being proud of being white, being proud? Where's the limit of... Uh, I guess really what we talk about here being proud versus uh, straight up racist. Well, actually, when you look at, you know, Islamic Sharia, you'll see that in, in, in the case of marriage, for instance, one of the four aspects of kafa'a, which is suitability, you know, uh, with beauty, you know, with wealth, uh, uh, is lineage. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, when you want to marry somebody in Islam, you need to know their family. You need yeah. to know their background, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Hujurat that he made us into nations and tribes. And so we are in nations and tribes. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in the battle of Hunayn, when, when, when the enemies were pouring down on the Muslims, and, and somebody said, I killed Muhammad. And so the Muslims were in a confusion. And so the Prophet had to identify himself. So he said, Anad Nabi la kathib. Anna ibn Abdul Muttalib. Allahu Akbar, yes. He said, I am the prophet, no lie. I am one of the sons of Abdul Muttalib. So he identified himself as Hashimi. So, so by identifying his genealogy, his lineage, then everybody said, that's him. Mm, mm. So it's, it's used as an identification, I guess, exactly. a tool as opposed to a pride tool. Okay, mashallah. Mm -hmm. So... But 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 the shocking point, and I you know I have I want the brothers and sisters to excuse me, because I'm going to drop some heavy stuff on you, right? Mm. And um, you know the experiences I had in Medina, um, I had some shocking experiences, and, and this is as an African American myself and another brother, uh, Sheikh Bilal Phillips, we were the first two Americans to go into the the Kulia to Dawa any college in Arabia, mm. and so we reached the second year. And we were doing well in class. Of course, they thought we were Moroccans or Sudanese or Egyptian or something like that. No. Because we are right in the class. Everything is in Arabic. There's no English at all. We're doing well in the class. And um, we were standing in back of two uh, teachers. I won't say which country they came from. And they were talking. They were talking in Arabic. And one of them said, who, who are these two guys in the class? Are these guys Americans? And you know, the answer was, they're not the real Americans. Mm. And, and, and I'll tell you, that hit us like a brick. Mm -hmm. You're not the real Americans. No. These are high-level Islamic teachers. And in their, in their mind was that the real American is the white American. Yeah. That is the essence of white supremacy. Those are the teachings, you know, which have been used as a propaganda mechanism to subjugate all of our countries, the superiority of the Europeans, you know, over people of color. And, and these high level professors were actually expressing this uh, about students who they should be joyous about us. We were the first two ever to reach this, but no, they looked at us as something which is not important because mm -hmm. the real Americans you know, have not come yet. But these types of sentiments, Sheikh, in Arabia, uh, they do exist even amongst the actual uh, African Arabs. You know, um, in Mecca and in Medina, for instance, there are uh, men and women who are much darker than you and I, uh, much, um, uh, I guess really, I, guess I don't even want to say, you can't even say it's much more African, but, uh, but even those people who have been in Mecca and in Medina and even Riyadh, for instance, uh, for for so many for so many years, Sheikh, uh, to the point where they, they don't have an actual uh, place of origin, and they're still not considered as um, 
Saudis, they're not considered as whatever country, the country that comes from. I don't mean to actually point out the country itself. And I don't mean this is a policy, by the way. I mean, this is an actual attitude by a lot of people. So this is it, it, it doesn't seem to me very far fetched. Right. Like, <laughs> no, this is a reality. And actually, I was living in Medina for a number of years to the point where I was being accepted as one of the people of Medina. Nam. And I lived in Harra Garbiya, and I was living with the Juhayna tribe. Mm -hmm. and, um, so one day I was uh, you know, drinking some coffee and talking to one of the Bedouins. And so the Bedouin said to me, um, you know, there's a guy down the street who wants to move in. I said, okay, describe him. He said, you know, that Abd uh, mm. had a house. And I said, and now I'm new in Arabic, right? Mm. Wait a minute, brother. But you can understand it. Abd means slave. Slave, yeah. That's a black person over there. Uh, what are you talking about? He said, and so the Bedouin said, he's an Abd. Yeah. He's a slave. And I said, no, he's not a slave. Yeah. He's a Muslim. He's an African. He's, and he said, no, he's an Abd. So within their language, and, and there was no hatred in his, in his face, by the way. It's become normalized. It was normalized that black people are slaves or they are of the lower class. Mm. Because of the last few hundred years where, where black people were in a position to a certain extent, in, in many of the countries uh, where they were domestic workers and, you know, whatever. Um, and also because of white supremacy, you know, which is coming over the, the, the media. Mm -hmm. then, he, then, then he said to me, oh, yeah, by the way, where are you from? I'm to Masri, well, I'm Maghrib. <laughs> you know, are you an Egyptian? You know, because then you can't be. Yeah. yeah. Because he knows you know, I, I can't be an African. I said, no, Anna, I'm Riki. Yeah. I'm an American. Yeah. And he said, oh. No, he said, no, 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 no. You're not an American. Yeah. The Bedouin talking now, right? Mm -hmm. he said, you're not, but he's watching TV. So he said, you're not, a, you're not an American. So mm. I said, I am an American. Mm. Finally, he said, okay, you're South American. America Genovia. Mm -hmm. Because he couldn't believe I'm a North American. Yeah. Because yeah. that's supposed to be a white person, European, right? Yeah. But even a Bedouin on the outskirts of Medina who has just resettled into the town and watches TV, he his mind is being affected by white supremacy, which is coming through the television, which has been translated into our languages in the Muslim world, combined with our own experiences. So Muslims are coming to this part of the world with that type of thinking. Exactly, yeah. Exactly. They're, they're opening up masjids. They're, they're becoming part of the community. They're, they're listening to white supremacy. And so... Yeah. What is happening is that this is having a devastating effect uh, upon new Muslims, especially mm -hmm. those of African descent, and even white Muslims, by the way. Because I remember there was a white Muslim brother. He came from Sweden, and he was living in uh, Harra Sharqiyya, and I was in Harra Garbiya. In, in Medina, this is in Medina, right, Shah? In a different section of Medina. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one day I had him and his wife over uh, my house and, to play with my children. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's uh, Swedish, right? So, I mean, they are white people, seriously yeah. white, right? Yeah. I mean, you go by the skin color, right? Yeah. So, his daughter was, you know, uh, wanted to go out and play. My, my daughter, Bill Peace, was out in the streets. She went out, and the little Bedouin started stoning my daughter, right? And calling her name, Takruni, and all these different... Mm. They're stoning my daughter. And then, when, 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 the, when the white girl came... They they all said, Oh, Yahilua, Yahilua, oh you sweet thing. And then and then they chased her back to the house. We had to hold off the kids. And they were saying, Yahilua, Yahilua, you oh you beautiful, sweet thing. The girl, the little girl was crying, man. She was crying. And then, you know, the brother, brother Omar, he, he recognized that the, that, that the reason why they, they, they were treating him like this is not because of his taqwa. It's because, because of his color. His color. And it must be a devastating thing for someone who's uh, who's just learning about this, right? Yeah, I mean, the, that brother actually was so sincere, he left Medina. SubhanAllah. And he said, I did not come to be raised up because of my color. SubhanAllah. He came into Islam because he wanted to fight racism. SubhanAllah. And, and now he was falsely being placed on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. So this is a very serious issue, and, and it's going to take time to unpack this. And the real black eye documentary is, is sort of our entrance, you know, into the understanding of what racism is mm -hmm. and the reality of, you know, our community. It, it is like 
opening the door for the community. It's like no. a shock. It's no. a shock to understand when people are in the streets and saying Black Lives Matter, what they actually mean. They're not talking about just physically. They're talking about they can't breathe politically, economically, socially, spiritually. This is what is happening uh, in, uh, in America, in the West, especially in America. And it's important for our community to understand what's actually going on. Very wonderful. So, I mean, you've actually mentioned this right now because I want to, before you go away uh, or before we move on to, to another topic, I do want to talk about your course that you've been offering so far. I'm going to put a link uh, to the uh, the course itself that's being offered, Sheikh, here, which is the Black Muslim Experience. Talk to us a little bit about this uh, course, Sheikh. Yeah, this, this course now, of course, there's a lot of information to unpack. And... Um, I put together four parts uh, in a concentrated way. This is based upon travels and lectures, you know, so that uh, we could actually begin to, in a positive way, understand uh, who were who were black people. What is Africa actually about? Who are the African people in ancient history? And what was the relationship of African people to the early Muslims, to the Prophet Sallallahu Everybody talks about Bilal, right? Brother no. Bilal. But how many people know that Bilal had a brother? Mm. How many people know that Bilal had a sister named Ghafira? Mm. How many people know that there were a number of African people around the Prophet ﷺ that Salim, Mola uh, Abi Hudayfa, was one of the four top readers of Quran? He was a black man. How many people know that? So yeah. We want to unpack this to begin to show the history. Then we want to travel into the first hijrah, into uh, Al-Habasha, and then across North Africa, and then down across the desert into Timbuktu, and, and to even show how African Muslims came to the Americas before Columbus, and then mm -hmm. show in the slavery period how many uh, uh, African scholars, Muslims, were here in the Americas and the things that they've left. There's so much to unpack, and I, I've concentrated it into a four- week uh, 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 course. So this is for we, uh, four classes, basically. Right. So it's, okay. starting, it's starting October uh, 10th on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And it, every Saturday going on, it'll be uh, on the Saturday. And um, it'll have a chance for questions and answers. There'll also be documentaries. I will be releasing documentaries to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I took a journey into Ethiopia myself with a film crew. I went to the grave of Najashi, the great Negus. Um, so that will be released to people who haven't seen my documentary films. There's also will be uh, literature, references. So this, in a sense, is an opening for people that mm -hmm. we hope, inshallah, uh, will stimulate people uh, to broaden their minds in terms of uh, base as Muslims and also what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. So I guess really what you're trying to do here, Sheikh, is, is uh, like normalize the actual, um, the, the black experience within the actual, uh, the Muslim community in itself. itself. So as opposed to using uh, Bilal ibn Rabah as a, as a token, really, of, of your knowledge of, of, of the black history, you should actually know um, more of the companions, uh, more of what they have done, and also the role of black men and women. Um, in what they have done to the actual religion itself as a whole. That's, that's right, because I mean, even in, when I lived in, in South Africa, um, the, the person who called the Adhan, whether he was African or not, they called him Bilal Bong. Mm. Bilal Bong is Mu'addin, right? So that's interesting. <laughs> because, that's... because they thought that the only position, and normally it was people from Malawi who called the Adhan in uh, South African masjids, mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. the country in Africa. Mm -hmm. Although the Malawians are great scholars as well, right? Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, and and yeah. they probably had more knowledge than all the people in the masjid. But because mm -hmm. they were African, they had to be a Bilal Bong. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is the wrong understanding, you know, of, 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 of people. And it's not Sunnah. It's not the way of the Prophet Sallallahu and it is not what is, has been happening in, in, in throughout Islamic history. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this is actually, uh, it's an amazing thing that you've mentioned this here, because uh, one of the things that I want to tell you or talk to you about, and I, I you know, again, I don't want, first of all, I'm going to talk to everybody here. I don't want anyone to think that we are talking or bashing a group of people or, or in a sense, really, in a sense, critiquing anybody. What we're trying to do is start, we're talking about a, a general, uh, I guess, topic 
and issues that we we see are pro as problematic and we just kind of want to have a discussion about them and one of the things yeah that I, and i've always grown up to have this so i'm from sudan as, as many of you guys would know um as we're growing up there was always this attempt to um point out to us uh you know, uh, major scholars, major sheikhs and major scholars as people who come from Arabia um, and uh, or of Arab descent in a sense, right? Uh, and then when people call that out, when people say to them, well, that's not like, that's not very, that's not the way it is. People then start to go ahead and mention, uh, you know, Al-Bukhari and Muslim and so on. So we'll say, well, all these guys weren't Arabs. As well, right? So the kind of, but at the same time, you never ever, Sheikh. I, you know, I honestly, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie. I, I don't ever recall studying about uh, an African scholar of Islam, and yeah. I know that you've done your PhD on uh, like an amazing. So talk to us a little bit about what you, what, what we're thinking here. Yeah, you know, the the first point, which is very important uh, for us, we need a a mind shift, a concept shift, because yeah. Africa does not stop below the Sahara. Mm. Africa actually includes Egypt. Yeah. And it includes all across North Africa, you know, and right down if you want to talk about a continent. No. Yeah, for Africa is a huge place. You can put India and China into Africa. That's yeah. And so um, there's many different tribes and nations inside of Africa. So the concept of being an African, right, is not necessarily linked to a particular color of the skin, right? And, um, uh, but what I want to do, because people may not have not have not met black African scholars. Yeah, there are there are scholars from Africa, from Morocco, or from Egypt who might not be you know black, dark black, mm -hmm. right? But you know to introduce uh, uh, them to that. And I studied, you know, the, the 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 spread of Islam into North Africa and into Andalusia, and at the same time it went down across the Sahara. Mm. And um, a great movement on Murabitun, who revived Islam in the 11th century, they connected West Africa, North Africa to Andalusia, and all the way to Egypt. And they, and they were a powerful movement. This is the Maliki school of thought. That's right. And, and so within the, 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 the continuity of the Maliki culture, in a sense, if I can use that term, African people were recognized as the great warriors, the great scholars. They were, you know, Timbuktu, uh, a city which I visited, and I will be releasing a, a documentary that I made in Timbuktu. Timbuktu, that most people say, oh, go to Timbuktu. Yeah, and like, like as if it's the end of the world. Right. But Timbuktu, <laughs> in, in the 16th century, the Sankode University was, had 25,000 students. And they were studying science, math, they were masters in um, uh, Maliki fiqh, and they were recognized, you know, in Cairo, Egypt, uh, uh, Azhar University, when it eventually came, they recognized the scholars coming out of West Africa, mm -hmm. also uh, uh, Qadawiyin in, in Morocco, they recognized the scholars of, of West Africa. And so what I want to do is to bring out some of the names of these scholars, and inshallah, I want to um, have another course which is coming, inshallah. Inshallah, it's Sheikh Uthman Denfodio. Yes, you know, who was a great scholar, and um, it's amazing when you read his biography. Mm -hmm. This is a scholar, you know. To give you an example, this person is in the 18th century now. You know, his 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 father and mother are both scholars. His uncles are scholars. You know, by the age of um, uh, uh, 20, he had, he had mastered Maliki fiqh. Um, he had teachers from the Tuareg, he had teachers from different groups, and he started to do Dawah. And uh, within a short period of time, when, when, when this man traveled from city to city, he had a thousand students traveling with him. Allahu Akbar. A thousand students. So they would travel to the desert and the savanna, and then he, he sits under a tree, and that becomes the madrasa. It's like a moving university. Allahu Akbar. And so, you know, there's amazing stories like this of the scholarship, um, which we want to bring out. And, and people have not been uh, privy to this information. So, inshallah, we want to bring it out uh, in a very uh, uh, easily uh, accessible way. 
Inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Uh, so if anybody has a question that they want to ask, Inshallah, the Sheikh, uh, we only have a couple of minutes before Maghrib is coming on. Uh, I'm in the east end of the city. So Maghrib comes a little bit earlier for me than anybody else here. But maybe before we go on anywhere, let me go ahead and uh, just give some shout out to some people who are uh, who've been joining us here for a little bit of time. Um, yes, Salaam Alaikum, Brother Faithuddin. Salaam Alaikum, Rahmatullah. How are you, man? Uh, it's been a while, brother. I hope you're doing well. He has the dean, right? Yes, yes. Allahu Akbar. Yes, Naam, Naam. MashaAllah. Yes. Naam. Uh, Sheikh Nasib. Uh, brother Nasir Ahmed. Alhamdulillah. May yeah. Allah bless you, honey. Ali man, Hamidillah. And I have uh, us. Allahu Akbar. Sister Sakina bint Eric. Oh, Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to this live. And um, brother Asad, welcome to our live. Um, Sister Kalsum says, Salam Sheikh, your experience and knowledge uh, on these issues is much appreciated. Jazakallah khair, may Allah Azzawajal bless you all, inshallah, for joining us. This has been, it's actually really amazing. Uh, we've got about 60 people who are actually on here right now. Uh, we are talking, and I know there's a, de there's a debate that's happening here between two people who are actually sitting in the actual uh, <laughs> discussion here. Oh, Salam Alaikum, Brother Sulaiman is saying Salam Alaikum as well. MashaAllah. Yes, now. Barbados. Uh, uh, from Barbados. Oh, Allahu Akbar. MashaAllah. Yes. Mashallah. How was the weather there, Brother Suleiman? I, I, I heard I heard very positive things about Barbados in these types of days. Yes. Yes. My grandmother came from Barbados, right? Allah, so, so, yes. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bajan people. Yes. Allahu Akbar. You know, Suleiman, I'll be talking to you and the others. This course is very important. Mm -hmm. And um, to the extent where, you know, people should be you know, paying the cost because we are doing it professionally. Yeah. However, if there are brothers and sisters who cannot afford this, then please let us know because we don't want to leave anybody behind. Yes. And yes. Uh, we, will, we will provide support for people who need to have this. No. So we're asking you if, if you if, if, if you can't or if somebody cannot, no. let us know their name. Mm -hmm. Let us be in touch with them and write something about them. And inshallah, we will actually provide scholarships for them. But, you know, we, this is a, a community effort because we want to do it uh, in a professional way. Allahu Akbar. So, yes. So, uh, for those of you who are taking the course, those of you who can, you can pay for an extra person actually to take the course as well and sponsor them if you wish to do so. Uh, you know, I, I, you know. I don't even want to say anything in front of the sheikh, but like the sheikh never, ever, ever lets you down when it comes to these types of, uh, of course, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, so Brother Suleiman said the weather is hot. We have Sister Khadija, uh, salams from Texas. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi. Welcome, uh, Sister Khadija from Toronto. Beautiful text from beautiful Toronto to beautiful Texas. Uh, uh, salam alaikum from Calgary. Uh, Brother Christopher, I hope you're doing well, man. Uh, Suleiman Balbula is good. Texas again. Oh, mashallah. So we have everybody, people from everywhere. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil Alameen. Uh, Sister Amina is asking how to register for the class. So Sister Amina, go ahead and uh, you'll find the link uh, in one of the comments that we placed up there. So I'm actually going to go ahead and place the link again. Yes. So it's it's this link here. Sister Amina, you can go ahead and share the course itself, inshallah ta'ala, to go to the... Uh, Sheikh Abdullah's uh, website, which is www.hakeemquick.com courses um, backslash black Muslims. We have Salam from Germany as well. Alhamdulillah. Hi, Sophie Yusuf. Mashallah. Oh man, in Germany, what are you doing up so uh, so early? I hope. Uh, I hope you're. There. I hope you're waking up just for us, or maybe for Fajr. Inshallah. May Allah bless you. Inshallah. Mashallah. Yes, Alhamdulillah. And to everybody, even those of you of you who have we haven't mentioned, I I, I pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala bless you all uh, for us being here. Please go ahead and share this uh, live stream, Inshallah. Me and Sheikh are going to, uh, I guess, really, I, I I like this, Sheikh. I don't know. Do you want to do more of those live streams? I think yes, you know, I think successful. What we can try to do is, um, for the next you know week or so, we can we can try to do one, you know, either every day or every other day. We're going to let you know. And no. we're going to talk about different aspects because mm -hmm. there's a lot to unpack. No. So this is not the end. Just just you know, yeah. keep keep watching the Facebook, Instagram, you know, and we will tell you when the next one is. No. Um, tomorrow, um, I've got a program tomorrow. I've got classes tomorrow, but maybe inshallah, Wednesday, Thursday, we'll try to be back on again. Um, so, and also, uh, for those of you, uh, you can also, inshallah, follow me as well. I'll be sharing a lot more of this, uh, bi ta'ala, on my Facebook, or also on Instagram. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah, you're also on Instagram, right? That's right. 
Okay, so I'm going to actually go ahead and type my Instagram handle here, and I'm going to go ahead and get you Abdullah, and then we'll put them on here as well, so you can go ahead and follow us. Right. Abdullah.quick, I think it's going to be nice. Um, so, and Sheikh Abdullah is at Abdullah.quick. Yeah. On Instagram for the both of us. Um, so, go ahead, inshallah. Uh, so, Brother Rashid is asking if we will work with uh, Sheikh Abu Toba in the future. I don't know if the question is for me or for Sheikh Abdullah, but I uh, personally, I actually do have a project that I'm working on with Sheikh uh, Abu Toba, inshallah. Ta'ala. I don't know if Sheikh Abdullah will be, um, but I, I'm, I'm assuming he will be, inshallah. Well, hopefully, inshallah, we will yeah. see, see what we work on. Sheikh Abdullah, we have a question here from Brother Kwame. Uh, it says, have you seen the book Defining Legends, a response to the Afrocentric prejudice to Islam? No, I, I haven't seen that book. It sounds very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, because for a long time, I actually structured many of my lectures to respond to the Afrocentrics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so these are people who look at it. And actually, I, I went to, uh, I met Ivan Van Sertema, Asa Hilliard, you know, and, and some of the leaders uh, within the, I, you know, I actually consider Ivan Van Sertemar as one of my mentors. Allahu Akbar, yes. A, you know, Afrocentric scholar. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I went to Egypt. And I literally went up mm -hmm. the Nile. I went down in the pyramids, you know, uh, underground to the temples, had Shepsut. You know, I saw the, you know, uh, Somalis doing business with Egyptians on mm -hmm. the walls of, of you know, the, the temples. You know, and actually I found Tawheed. So the response was that in ancient Egypt, there was Tawheed. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets and messengers to all nations and all tribes. Mm. Muhammad sallallahu was, was the seal so. of the prophets, but he no. wasn't the first. And the Pharaoh that we know with Musa alayhi salam was only one of the Pharaohs. There was hundreds of them. And so literally I, I found mm. aspects of Tawheed in ancient Egyptian society. Mm. And I did it with the concept of the universality of prophethood. You know, and, and that is a response to extreme Afrocentrics. You know, who, who who try to say that everything is in Africa, you know, and try to cut out the concept of revelation, being yeah. all nations and all tribes. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Inshallah. So he's uh, commenting on his book here. Inshallah, we'll uh, we'll try to actually read it. Inshallah, brother Kwame. Inshallah, we'll see if we can get uh, this book here. We have a comment from brother uh, Ibn Yusuf. Salam alaikum. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Uh, please keep up the good work. Barakallahu feek, brother Yusuf. May Allah bless you. Inshallah. We have Salam from Connecticut. This is a very difficult state for me. It's always been. Um, when I was younger, I used to pronounce it as Connecticut, but right, it's Connecticut, so it is what it is, inshallah ta'ala. So if, there, if no one else has any questions, inshallah, um, Sheikh Abdullah, I do want you to maybe give us a, a departing word, inshallah, so we can um, close up the uh, this live stream, inshallah. Maybe we'll come on another time, bismillah ta'ala. Yes, we, we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would protect the Muslims and enlighten us, you know, in these in this period that we are in. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept our work and would and help our children to be enlightened, you know, leaders of the world. Subhanakallahu bihamdika, nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta, nastaqfiruka wa natubu ilaik, wa akhira da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We respect them. But we want them to respect us. We think that the law should respect the Negro community. The law should protect the Negro community. The law should approach the Negro community with intelligence if it expects the Negro community to react intelligently.